In the last episode of the Hunky Vape Global 20, I said there were so many other stories I wanted to talk about this week. And since all of these are based on science or someone's firsthand account, they'll be in the next episode airing in a few days. So, ain't nothing to it but to get into it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy and News for the week ending April 5th, 2022. Michelle Mittal, the current Deputy Director of the Food and Drug Administration Center for Tobacco Products, will become the new Acting Director in mid-April. On March 30th, the FDA told Filter that she will assume the role once Mitch Zeller, CTP's current director, retires in a few weeks the agency has not yet made a public announcement. However, there have been several websites that have been speculating this natural progression from deputy director to acting FDA director of the Center for Tobacco Products. With her extensive experience as a policy analyst, staffing the Center for Tobacco Products, implementing the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act of 2009, and Being deputy director, she's had a hand or been exposed to everything coming out of the FDA CTP since its inception. This also includes content from the FDA Spotlight on Science, new studies, and report available. I got this in my email on March 21st. So how about we look at just a few of these scientific studies conducted by the CTP researchers. Systemic Biomarkers of Exposure Associated with Ends Use, a scoping review. What did this study find? Biomarkers of most VOCs are lower in ENDS users compared with cigarette smokers, and cigarette smokers who switch to ENDS consistently show reductions in VOC biomarkers. Are you surprised? I'm not, but here's another study clearly showing smokers need to switch to ENDS to lower the VOCs they're currently getting from smoking. Next study, Transitions to Smokeless Tobacco Use Among Adult Cigarette Smokers in the Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health, aka PATH, study, Waves 3 through 5, 2015 to 2019. This study examined patterns of use dual use of cigarettes and smokeless tobacco, and complete switching over time from 2015 to 2019. Among exclusive smokers who switched to dual use, 53.1% returned to exclusive cigarette smoking, 34.3% maintained dual use, and 12.6% did not smoke cigarettes after an additional wave of follow-up. So let me get this straight. Smokers who switch to dual use, aka lowering their VOCs as documented by the previous study, 53% go back to smoking. 34% are still dual using in two years. So they're still lowering their VOCs. And 12.6% stopped smoking simply because they tried vaping. I find that amazing and something to sing accolades about, especially considering only 8% of smokers who try to quit smoking are still smoke-free six months later. And what the FDA doesn't say is that the actual percentage of that 8% go back to smoking a year or two later. So the actual success rate a year down the road or two years down the road is much, much lower. Yet here we have smokers who had no intention of quitting, and 12.6% of them quit smoking because they tried vaping. This doesn't even include the smokers' success in lowering their VOC intake, because 34.3% of them were still dual using in two years. And that's a net benefit for public health. Some get the full benefit because they ended up quitting smoking, And some got partial benefit because they still dual use. Yet this obvious finding is nowhere to be found in the conclusion of this research paper. 
So what did the paper's conclusion state? Very few cigarette smokers transition to smokeless tobacco use. And among those who do, dual use is more common than exclusive smokeless tobacco use. Further, the majority of exclusive cigarette smokers who transition to dual use at wave four continue smoking cigarettes at wave five, either as dual users or as exclusive smokers. Hello? How about the fact 47% lowered or eliminated their VOC intake and will consequently improve their health outcomes? How come these scientists ignore the public health benefits and only condemn smokeless tobacco as ineffective to transition smokers from smoking? Their own study shows it's twice as effective to quit smoking as a determined smoker is to quit using available cessation products. Hey, that's exactly what the next study evaluated. Association of e-cigarette use with discontinuation of cigarette smoking among adult smokers who were initially never planning to quit. Cigarette smokers not planning to quit are often overlooked in population studies evaluating the risk-benefit potential of electronic nicotine delivery products, otherwise known as e-cigarettes. So naturally, the objective of this study was to evaluate whether e-cigarette use is associated with discontinuing cigarette smoking among smokers who were initially never planning to quit. So what did this study find? Overall, 6.2% of the population discontinued cigarette smoking. Discontinuation rates were higher among those who used e-cigarettes daily, 28%, compared with not at all, 5.8%. Furthermore, 10.7% discontinued daily cigarette smoking with higher rates of discontinuation observed among those who used e-cigarettes daily, 45.5%, compared with not at all, 9.9%. So cigarette smokers with no intention of quitting smoking were almost five times more likely to quit smoking if they daily used an e-cigarette. That is the exact reason the FDA needs to grant marketing authorization for all vaping products. Even their own CTP researchers have documented the net public health benefit of these products. There's a link to all these studies in the description below. Go check them out if you don't believe me. Moving on. The science behind nicotine addiction from pretty big butterflies. Quite a large number of people assume nicotine is a toxic substance because it is found in tobacco cigarettes, which cause plenty of health problems for those that smoke them. But what if we told you of all the substances found within cigarettes, nicotine is actually one of the least harmful. The perception of nicotine causing cancer has been damaging to the e-cigarette industry because their products can contain nicotine, which people view in a bad light, when actually it satisfies a craving while proving to be far less harmful than smoking tobacco cigarettes. While still being highly addictive, the effects of nicotine when it comes to harm done to the body are as negligible as caffeine. So we're going to set the record straight on a lot of misconceptions when it comes to nicotine and try to explain the effects it can have on the body. When public perceptions are often skewed, it's good to go back to the bare facts to get a proper education on the subject. How much nicotine is in a cigarette? The usual cigarette contains approximately 10 milligrams of nicotine. However, a lot of this doesn't make it into your body due to getting caught in the filter. So in the end, you only end up with about one milligram of nicotine being absorbed into your body per cigarette. Actually, it's not that simple, nor is the one milligram of nicotine totally accurate. If you wanna know the nicotine absorption, you need to look at the plasma nicotine content over time. Here's a video from UCLA School of Medicine documenting the blood nicotine levels. From a cigarette, the plasma concentrations peaked at around five minutes 
with 18 nanograms per milliliter of nicotine. The VUSE device peaked around 14 nanograms per milliliter. An Inikin device peaked around 12 nanograms, while most other vaping devices peaked around 7 to 10 nanograms per milliliter of blood. This chart comes from a psychopharmacology paper titled Nicotine Delivery to Users from Cigarettes and from Different Types of E-Cigarettes, published in March of 2017. Link below if you want to go and check it out. What's interesting about this study was that they took 48 milligram per milliliter nicotine, 24, 20, and 16 milligram per milliliter nicotine concentrations appropriate for the vaping devices that they put them in and had experienced vapors use them in a normal fashion. This included multiple Sigalike brands as well as more advanced systems. And they concluded EC brands we tested do not deliver nicotine as efficiently as cigarettes, but newer EC products deliver nicotine more efficiently than original Sigalike brands. Moderate variations in nicotine content of e-liquid have little effect on nicotine delivery. Smokers who are finding Sigalike EC unsatisfactory should be advised to try more advanced systems. Now, us vapors would completely agree with the first and the last sentence of that conclusion. But we know for a fact, variation of nicotine content in e-liquid has a massive effect on nicotine delivery and satisfaction of use. If you use even 16 milligrams in an advanced cloud chucker, it's going to give you a sore throat, a headache, and might even make you nauseated with just a few tokes whereas the same device with only 6 milligrams will work perfectly for most. So dosage does make a difference. And it's exactly why Juul and Puff Bar have ultra-high concentrations of nicotine, while most open tank vapor systems use 3 or 6 milligrams of nicotine. Regardless, the facts remain. Newer, more advanced systems are much more effective than older, outdated technology devices. And I guarantee you this hide, or this humble, or this Frio bar is way more effective to quit smoking than any jewel bar. There's no way a 2017 technology product would be able to outperform a 2022 product. And here's the real problem that this science from back in 2017 has just demonstrated. The FDA needs to realize that their slow regulatory red tape PMTA process is going to kill more people than if they simply authorize any and all applications they receive for new tobacco products like this Frio bar. From a toxicology perspective, as long as a product does not contain cinnamonaldehyde or levels of diacetyl more than what's going to be in a cigarette, it's definitely much safer than smoking and a net gain for public health. Don't believe me? Go listen to this Science Cafe video from 2018, where Elona Jaspers, a toxicologist from the University of North Carolina Center for Environmental Medicine, talks about the health effects of e-cigarettes. Let me be honest, she does not think highly of vaping. She says it's not vapor, it's an aerosol with fascinating chemistry to a toxicologist. But even this toxicologist states, as long as you stay away from cinnamon flavors, e-cigarettes are a public health benefit. And I'm not kidding, folks. At 59 minutes and 15 seconds, a former smoker tells the toxicologist that she's been smoking for 25 years. And two years ago, she tried a vape with 28 milligrams. And then, later on, advanced to advanced vaping devices. And now, she's down to only 3 milligrams of nicotine, and she vapes daily because she doesn't smoke. So here's her question to the toxicologist. She says she vapes a flavor. 
Is it safe to keep using the vape? The toxicologist tells her, this is exactly the public health debate right now. E-cigarettes are a public health benefit for smokers. In other words, yes, you should definitely reduce the health risk caused by smoking and keep on vaping. Science has clearly shown it is a much safer product and improves the health of smokers from the moment they start vaping. So with all this evidence, why hasn't the FDA authorized any real vaping products? Clearly, the science demonstrates how the latest products are much better than the products that they've authorized so far. No. Why would they authorize them? They would rather drag their feet on the products that actually get people to quit smoking and instead authorize big tobacco products that are so ineffective that most of them aren't even available in the United States anymore. Has this virtual ban stopped smokers from going into vape shops and quitting smoking? Of course not. All the vape shops I've visited lately have seen record sales of products that keep people from smoking. The only thing vape shops are complaining about is how hard it's getting to replace inventory on their shelves. The vape mail ban and the PMTA requirements are showing their teeth, and we don't like it, said one vape shop employee. Another vape shop owner told me they're having a hard time keeping their shelves stocked and can't get the latest products. Is this good for public health? Are vape bans good for public health? Here, I got science to answer that question as well. The impact of banning electronic nicotine delivery systems on combustible cigarette sales. Evidence from U.S. state-level policies. Published March 5th of this year, we find our results show that cigarette sales in banned states were higher than would have been observed otherwise in the post-ban period. A full ban on ENDS was associated with increased cigarette sales of 7.5% in Massachusetts. Banning non-tobacco-flavored ENDS was associated with 4.6% higher-than-expected cigarette sales. Conclusions? This study provides evidence that banning ENDS is associated with increased cigarette sales. Future research is needed to determine the long-term impact of these policies. No, 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 no. Future research does not need to determine the long-term impact of these policies. Governments and the FDA need to authorize the sale of flavored vaping products to reverse this increase in cigarette sales. Furthermore, the e-cigarette industry is tired of being a vehicle for Big Tobacco's commercial interests. The remodulation of the tax on liquid inhalation products from 1 April to 31 December 2022, approved with an amendment to the DL Milliprog, only partially satisfies Anafe, the Italian Association of Electronic Smoke Producers belonging to Confundustria. The decree, in fact, while diffusing for only nine months the increases that came into force from 1 January 2022, that is 200%, increase on liquids without nicotine and 100% increase on liquids with nicotine still provides for a doubling of the tax burden compared to 2021. Excise duties will in any case increase by 100% on nicotine-free liquids and 50% on nicotine-free liquids. All this while traditional cigarettes, the main cause of death in the world, remain again free from any price increase. Even in Italy, legislation is destroying the single best way to quit smoking. A 200% increase in taxation is capable of destroying any supply chain. And when that supply chain is paramount to transitioning smokers away from combustion, it's beyond disgusting. It's democide. If you or I were in charge of issuing PMTA market authorization, and we knew the science documenting the public health benefit of these products, but then chose to delay or not authorize them, we would be guilty of involuntary manslaughter. 
According to Merriam-Webster, manslaughter resulting from the failure to perform a legal duty expressly required to safeguard human life is involuntary manslaughter. All around the globe, regulations and policy changers bolster big tobacco and consequently harm the public. The Chinese great ban risks revolutionizing the global vaping market for the worse. We've talked about this many times before, too. How the Chinese regulations don't just restrict the domestic market, but they're going to reverberate internationally. But did you know that the regulations are also going to forbid organized events, fairs, or exhibitions that promote the electronic cigarette and any accessories of it? I'm beginning to get the impression that this is all planned by the WHO at COP9. And we're going to start seeing more fallout in the coming months from these good-intentioned actions. Don't believe me? Well, here's the first of what I fear is going to be many COP9 initiatives rolling out in front of our eyes. From West Africa, we find Ghana to ban tobacco advertising and depiction in entertainment media. That sounds helpful, or at least not harmless. Until you read the fine print, anyone born after 2008 will not be able to buy cigarettes or tobacco products in their lifetime. The World Health Organization has selected Ghana as a Phase 3 country to help obtain a tobacco-free status. Phase 3 status? What Phase 3 status? FCTC 2030 was a United Kingdom-initiated five-year project starting in 2016 and was to run from April 2017 until March of 2021. There was no Phase 3, only Phase 1 and Phase 2 countries. So now Ghana is a Phase 3 country for a project that obviously did not expire March of last year? What else is going on internationally? Thailand's e-cigarette ban has been confirmed by Thai Tobacco Commission. Just when we thought Thailand was going to finally get around to legalizing vaping, along comes the WHO Convention on Tobacco Control. Sorry, folks. We need to prevent cigarette addiction in children, adolescents, and non-smokers. So, no harm reduction for you. Members agreed that Thailand, as a signatory to the World Health Organization's Convention on Tobacco Control, should maintain the ban to prevent cigarette addiction in children, adolescents, and non-smoking adults, said Kiyatapalm, who chaired the meeting. The ban will also help protect non-smokers from health risks posed by e-cigarettes and other tobacco-related products, the secretary said. What else do they say in this meeting? E-cigarettes and vaping remain popular in Thailand, despite the ban, said Grandpa Karna Kawapong, head of the Disease Control Department. In 2021, 78,742 Thais were caught smoking e-cigarettes, said Grandpa. Nearly a third of those, or 24,050, were young people between the ages of 15 and 24, he added. Wait a minute. These numbers don't add up. There were 24,000 young people vaping. And only 54,000 adult vapors? Thailand has a population of almost 70 million. Almost 21% of the population smokes. That's 14 and a half million smokers. Yet only 54,000 adults chose harm reduction over smoking. And they know for certain that 24,000 young people vaped? Do those numbers look plausible to you? Leave a comment, let me know what you think. Does prohibition work better on adults than kids? And is more prohibition the answer for the 14 and a half million smokers? Or has its failure 
mean that it's time to try legalization of vaping in Thailand. We already know what science tells us that they should be doing, and it's not what tobacco control just did. Thailand isn't the only one doing an about-face on harm reduction. Malaysia's vaping approval delayed by politics. Disappointing. Legislation to regulate vaping in Malaysia is pending parliamentary approval, but frustratingly will now be delayed due to political instability and election campaigning, said Samsul Kamal Arafan, president of MOVE, Malaysia Organization of Vape Entities. Malaysia has almost 5 million smokers. How many of these people need to die before their country adopts harm reduction to save their lives? Maybe Malaysia needs to look at what actually works. So how about we look to the UK and Public Health England Stoptober Tobacco Marketing Program. Stoptober launched in 2012 and is entering its ninth year. The campaign aims to inspire as many smokers as possible to make a quit attempt from 1 October and maintain for at least 28 days. Evidence shows that if you stop smoking for 28 days, you are five times more likely to stop for good. Since 2012, Stoptober has driven over 2.3 million quit attempts. Something else the UK has which I think should be adopted globally, is Vapril. Seasoned vapors are to be celebrated this week with the start of April, the world's largest and most successful campaign, which aims to spread awareness and champion the benefits of vaping. Organized by the UK's Vaping Industry Association, the campaign, now in its fifth year, was launched by TV doctor Christian Jensen, star of Channel 4's Embarrassing Bodies, aims to show established vapors and Britain's 7 million smokers alike the different types of vape products on the market, offer advice as to whether vaping is the right choice for them, and help all to vape responsibly. It's time we were consistent and gave clear advice to smokers to help combat the misinformation they are all too often bombarded with. About vaping, says Christian Jensen. Listen, I know we're running long, folks. So how about we just watch a single vaporal success story? So without further ado, let me introduce you to Bill. Hi, I'm Bill from Jedra. How long did you smoke for? Smoking for 40 years. And I quit last March, started vaping then. Why did you start smoking? The reason I started smoking was because I was in the army and everybody else smoked and it was fashionable. And if you didn't smoke, you were an outcast. <laughs> uh, probably at that time I smoked maybe 10 a day because we didn't get paid much. Uh, but that progressed up to, I would say at the end up, probably up to 20 to 30 a day. How much did you spend on smoking? A day, uh, anywhere between 10 and 15 pound a day. Why did you decide to quit? Well, I've got COPD. Uh, breathing gets harder. Uh, the more you work, the harder it gets to breathe. And smoking doesn't help it. So I was convinced that uh, vaping would help that, which it did. Why did you decide to use a vape to quit? And at first I found it very difficult. So I was smoking and vaping. And then eventually I went to just vaping. And I was on 18 milligrams. And I kept on that and I kept on it for a good while. But then I kind of lapsed a wee bit and started smoking again. Um, and then went back to vaping and I'm now on 12 milligrams. It seems to be working and it's a lot better and saving me a fortune. What have been the positive impacts? Uh, first of all, on your health. I can breathe a lot easier. I don't cough as much, unless of course I've got a cold or something like that. Um, physically, it feels better. And the second and probably 
one of the important ones is it saves a lot of money. I would be spending somewhere between 70 and 80 pounds a week on cigarettes just now. And now I can get away with just buying bottles of juice that would be 10, 15 pounds. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is officially April 2022, Vaping Awareness Month. So please, go and share the wealth of knowledge that you have with whomever is willing to listen. Go post on social media your success story and go help a smoker find the truth about vaping. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending April 5th, 2021. If you found this video helpful and like the content, please hit the like button below. Or if you thought that this video sucked, well, go hit the appropriate button below. Either way, it's time for me to finally record the 750 subscriber thank you vlog. Some of it has already been recorded as we've revisited the vape shops in my previous thank you vlogs. and bought a bunch of stuff exclusively for this vlog. I'm planning on making a couple random e-liquid recipes and even gathered up a couple retro vapes to finally unbox. There's a couple new commercial e-liquids we're gonna try and I'm gonna give you progress on what's the best wicking material for vaping. All this and so much more is gonna be jam packed into that vlog. So until then, I hope you have a fantastic day. Please be good to each other and keep on vaping.